think the biggest thing you can do with an ISA team is make it fun. Uh, it's a tough job. There's lots of rejection on the phone. Um, we start our mornings every day with a morning on with our team release. Uh, we have the motivation Monday. What's motivating? What's driving you? What are you thankful for? Uh, yeah, we also go over our numbers uh, as a team. Uh, we have the ISA team and the ISA, so we know where we're at that week, what we need to do, and what we need to perform. Um, and then for like the fun things, like we have a big TV in our office. Um, all the ISAs uh, are up there. Every morning they put into a number of how many points they're going to book. Uh, once they hit that number, you get charged up to the office. It's like a game with a dark number and start publishing and changing the people that have not their numbers yet. Uh, we have uh, on that board that we have a countdown. So we work on it at least 24 appointments every, uh, every day. Um, and then instead of just putting our name every time that, you know, so the first person to look at a budget that day is to pick the topic. So, for example, we do like uh, college mascots or minor league baseball teams. Uh, and that's who that person is that day. Um, we do cowbells every time. You know, they look at a point in, uh, they drink the cowbell. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people can get people down the most is they get cussed at or something like that. And it never really happens all the time. Uh, but we try to turn it around and have fun with it. So, all of you can record our phone calls in Virginia. So. Uh, we just play the recording for the whole office to hear, and we just all have a good laugh. That's awesome. One time someone has me out, and I just said, oh, I didn't know I was one of those. And I thought it was hilarious. We all have a good laugh. I love that. Nice. All right, Claire or Amy, and then we'll jump to your question. So just real quick, what do you do to stay motivated or keep your team motivated? Yeah, I think for us, um, all of our ISA numbers are tied to what they want to make that year. Um, and then what they want to make, there's also um, typically a why behind that. Um, and so we try to keep that front of mind. Uh, we keep it in our office. I know it. Um, our director of ops does it. And we try to use that um, for if, if you know, you're having a rough day. Um, just remembering why you're there. Um, and then, like Mark said, we, it's just a fun environment, right? Where it's hard to make calls. And so the more um, of what you need to keep it there, the better. Um, music helps too. Lots of music. I just want to look at higher motivated people. Whoa, higher motivated You can't teach motivation, and so just be real intentional about that. You need to hire motivated people that have big goals and big why. It makes everything else easier. How do you know they're I think you kind of just said it, but how do you know for sure that they're motivated in an interview process? So you need to really get to know them. You need to understand their big why. You need to understand what would fund their big why. So if you meet someone and you're like, yeah, they seem great. They need 40 grand to make a great living. And you have an ISA and you want to make 100 grand in your business, they don't want it. So you need it to be in alignment of making sure that the money that it would take to fund their life is the type of money you want that ISA to generate for you. But it was a quote from a different breakout, and I might watch it a little bit, and it was to the effect of hire people that won't be offended working with you the way that you work. Right, so what's your what's your work style and hire people that have similar work styles is basically what that's saying. So I love that you said that. Awesome. So we I'm sure we have way more we can share. Everyone respect those in mind. So as you go, just take CNN versions, because we want to get through as many as we can and still get you guys out here on time. So yes. So my question is, um, as someone who does aspire to be a director of Gen, even inside sales, <laughs> how would you recommend an ISA that is currently in production? To transition into leadership, what does that schedule, that transition, that path really look like? And how do you guys recommend modeling that and how I would go about that? Good question. Basically, how do you transition from ISA production to leadership? Who wants to take that? Um, so, I personally am still in production, um, but a lot of it comes down to time blocking. Um, so, getting up every morning and what I do is I make sure that the ISA is on my team, they know what's expected of them. Uh, so that way it's less questions that are going to be directed at me throughout the day. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, time blocking is a big, big, big. I think that can help with that too is have a jar with a notebook. or You can use a lot of ways, but I literally had a flower base with some group by five cards so that they can write their questions down, get it off their brains so it's not distracting them. If they're not coming to me in that spot, it helps with time blocking. So every 24 hours, I take a jar and get to all their questions so you're not interrupted. That's one way you can do it. All right, let's go to the next question. For this, how about if someone answers and one of you has like a burning desire to share, just go for it, otherwise they're just gonna keep going. 
As you go, if you have a specific person, feel free to say who it's for. Okay, let's go to that back over there. So why do you expect, we we're in the process of having our first uh, person in the ISA role on our team. So good resources that you would suggest uh, as far as scripts for them, and then also I'm dying to find her a solid script partner. Who I'm, I want to find somebody who has a little bit more experience than her to help mold her. Um, well, not mold her, but to help her become better at the scripts. So any resources that you guys would suggest for scripts and finding script partners? Yeah, so leverage uh, you. Mold is a great way to get folks in, in ingrained in understanding the generation and just Keller Williams and real estate. Uh, there is Anna's uh, ISA mastermind group on Facebook. There's a couple other Facebook groups. Just get real connected to the ISA community. They can find multi partners through Mold as well as through, uh, there's also group mass coaching uh, for inside sales. So you can get them involved in a group coaching with Anna. And after if you go to the maskpajana.com and fill that out, you'll get updates as to when things are happening. It's, it'll take you to my personal email. It's me, it's not like some weird thing. It's me. <laughs> so what can you connect? Okay, let's go to this mic right here. Um, I have a question about appointment setting. So a lot of times these days, especially with buyer appointments, we have people wanting to see the properties. So if you guys are saying, are you, are you going ahead and letting them Look at one property, or we do require consultation from the very beginning. Um, yeah, so we don't call an appointment if they don't meet with us. Uh, we still will show a property occasionally, but the ISA is no longer allowed to call that an appointment. Um, so it does happen. What we try to do is just say, hey, uh, that's great. You know, you go over this for motivation, um, all of that good stuff. Um, sounds like your next step is to meet us in the office, and you just go with it until they push back, um, and that will cut them in half, at least for us, it cut them in half. So if they do want to see a house, then they're not going to It's a one-time show, and we give them one house, and then the agent decides that they keep them. Um, the ISA does not count as an appointment unless that lead and the something back in the office or the kind of my question is specific, so the ISA does get the appointment, you have multiple agents. I know Mark said that's the agent up, but uh, I'm not comfortable with that, so I'd like to hear other options, because I think that would make my other, I understand it. So if you look, do you have a Calendly app for your agents? How do you know who's available, I guess, and if you just, another idea besides the best agent up? So we use Google Calendar, um, so the ISA is set to be appointed, um, I still believe that I'm looking at who is converting the leads because 
because I want to protect, it's not my need, it's not their need to continue, and I want to protect that fence. I let's go here. How fast do reasonable comments happen? Ooh, great question. Okay, so just real quick, how do you compensate that? We do a straight base for the rain time, and then it goes to base plus commission. The base is 26,000 a year is basically what it equates to, and 10% uh, of the 3% or whatever when it closes. That's the most common, what she just said. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're 24% and then they get 5% of whatever is uh, split. Yeah, 24,000, I think it's 24,000. 24,000 and then 5% off of the team's local commission. And I think it really depends on what your price point is, because we talked about this. Yeah. Our price points are significantly different, so it makes sense. Average is 250. We're a little under 450. I think it's pretty much the same, right? Yeah. Mine's the same as well. <laughs> and um, our average price point is right around 250. Digital Statement Commission is, because I hear people say, hey, like, for an appointment showing up, we give them, like, 25 bucks, and then this. Here's the thing is, you don't get paid till something closes, right? And so it's much lower risk, and it's actually higher income opportunity for them as well, so it's like a win-win-win when you do the commission thing. They do have to be licensed, so that's one thing, which is, I recommend that anyway. Um, but that way, you, you're really just liable for the base, and then you're only paying them more when things close, which is, safer for you, and it also provides a bigger income opportunity for them. So that is what we see as the best practice. Okay, so over there. Yeah. Uh, first off, Anna, thank you so much. You are a queen panelist host, so you are <laughs> No problem, you brought some value as well, like, so thank you so much. Um, so my question is, um, best ways to communicate that the caller is handing off to another agent? I know we talked about it a little bit, but I know sometimes it's awkward for ISAs to say, hey, I'm not the actual, I'm not actually the person that is going to be going to the appointment, but well, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, yeah, it's really just ISA. Um, it's ingraining in them. I never say, and you never, you'll never hear me say, I'm here on the phone, you know, when you meet with me. So I'll say, hey, our team this, our team this. You never say anybody's specific name. I don't actually give them the name of somebody they would meet um, until they've agreed to set an appointment. Um, so it's very much building up the team and what the team can do. Um, and then you don't, they don't be disappointed when they don't get you. Like, you just build up this great team. They want your team. A great way to do someone that wants you to answer their questions, and then you they say, you know how to go to the doctor or the nurse might even, you know, they don't answer your questions as accurate as that. I'm a nurse, but you need a doctor. By the way, that gets them more excited to meet with the doctor, because we're painting them as the ultimate professional for what they need. So nurse, doctor, now is fantastic. And we just say expert. So if you're going to be with our experts, they're going to cover as our experts, so we're just going to continually kind of say that they're the expert in that space. Great question. Okay. Over here. Question is, how many leads inbound do you have coming into the team uh, on average on a monthly basis? And um, is there an ideal amount of new leads, specifically new leads that are assigned to an ISA? How much is too much? Does that matter? Great question. We have currently, I think, about 430 new leads a week coming in. Um, well, I know, like, 11 ISAs. And, yeah. yeah, and we're, we're, we're we both, well, 30% um, uh, when you compare the numbers of the number of women's books to new leads. Um, what was the second part of the question? Is there a particular number of leads that I say is uh, okay. new leads? So is there like a max, you okay. like a max number? So no, no specific number. Um, in our CRM, we have everything broken down by lead source and registration date. Um, so the new leads will be at the sort of the top there. And what I do, I do make sure that my eyes get to know every day what uh, filters they're expected to hit. Um, so the filters are very um, or alternate, so that way they see different phone numbers every day also. Um, the prospect that is, um, but yeah, there's no limit on the leads. Um, real quick, are, are you guys okay to say just a little extra? You can say no, it's not the way to go. So we are in the last session. I want to respect our awesome, let's come around and pause, AD person over there. Where the last one, but let's go an extra 10 minutes.
the hands, everybody. Uh, but still, let's keep it kind of short. And then after this, I'll cut it off. You can come up on if you need. But if you used to where you have to be, is 615. Okay, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, you're so great. Thanks. Over there. What are your top three to five uh, main sources of in-depth things that you're seeing coming up right now? I was just going to say, really look scary on the team to think of what you enjoy and what you're good at. That's probably going to be your best option, but go ahead with top three sources. I totally agree with you. Uh, as far as our top three inbound sources, we have radio and TV, we have Builder Network, and then referrals, so from our sphere of influence, our past clients and our vendors, those are our top buckets. Um, for us, um, sign calls are number one, um, and then um, internet leads um, would be right up there, and then um, like referrals and things like that that call in. Those would be our top and down. Um, Facebook, we're having a lot of success with Facebook, um, and then uh, sign calls and um, open contact. I'll add to that, because like, there were so many different answers, right? Gary talks about master five lead sources. So before adding new lead sources, look at what were my top five from last year. And if you're new on the team, you don't necessarily know yet, but maybe look at what did the team do before I showed up. What were their top five, and are we handling that at full? Like, we really got those systems down. And until you say yes to all five, you don't necessarily need to worry about adding the six and the seven, because then none of them will be handled excellently, right? So I would say look back at history and see what produced the most for the team to make sure that's running well and then start considering additional. Yep, okay, over here. Hi, um, I actually have two questions, one specifically for Mark and one for the group. Um, so Mark, I heard you say at the beginning that you focus on the inbound stuff. Um, so are things like inspired digital circle prospecting is that the responsibility of the agent or just not part of your business model? So it's not part, we do like inspire, so we have this like, that was sent out, we get the people to reach back out to us. So more marketing. Yeah, so it makes the conversation that much easier. Um, and we actually do a really good job. It's a, the cold calling is not part of our business yet. We're creating a digital that is going to be a department on our team very soon. Uh, so the other ISA we recognize that that's an opportunity for a growth for them. So that's, that's going to be another ISA leader on our team for department that's coming soon. Okay, and question for the group is what, if any, of the news you have on the services, like not a team within our, or, you know, our own team, but like a third-party vendor? So, uh, clearly we, we have our in-house, so we're probably biased on that. In my opinion, it would be down to, do you want to own the control, of, or like a quality control, and the control of what they're doing, or are you okay sorting that out, and then just going off what they maybe you know, bring you? We love the idea of, of having 100% ownership of the training they're going to receive, the expectations, the accountability. Um, so, so we have never outsourced. Hold on, I borrowed from Pachuca, and I pushed it to keeping track of stuff. Um, so, I pushed the button. Um, uh, yes, I agree with having it in house if at all possible. I have heard that um, Boat Animal or Conversion Monster. And I actually don't know much about either one of those, but I've heard them recommended from other panelists throughout this conference. So they don't have a track record for them. Uh, but in house tends to be best to get better results. Uh, yes, over there. Uh, my question, I, I was going to ask originally about the lead sources because currently my team, we, we get like zero in that leads. We, we do zero marketing, zero ads, nothing. So I'm just like uh, calling, like circle prospecting all day and database and sphere. But, uh, you know, one thing that he wants me to do is build out the team, get more ISAs in there, and I see the only way that we're going to do that is to start up the flow of inbound leads. So, you know, my, obviously you talked about radio, sign calls, all that. Like, in your opinion, based off where I'm at, what would be like, the, you know, the most cost-effective or best option to get started with inbound leads when you have zero? Facebook's a great option. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all kind of looked at each other because it's almost more of such a customized individual question. Um, my coach happens to know more. <laughs> so I don't think there's one right thing. Yeah. I agree, and I, and I, I would just say to you, we didn't have it found leads when we started in the sales department. We were outbound prospecting just like you are and growing that. 
and growing um, market uh, down the road. So I think it could look a lot of ways, like you said, whether it's inbound, half and half, A20, uh, there's a lot of different, different ways. Um, Smart has been a great source for us. We use that as a platform for home valuation tool, but it has a great ROI. When you use with the home valuation tool, like we leverage out Facebook and Google and things like that. Can you say that again? Smart SmartSip is just one of our sources that is a home valuation tool, and we use that tool and leverage it on our website, on Google, on Facebook ads. So when we when leverage that way, it has a really great ROI. It does take time, though, to build up. Yeah, to your point, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. There's a lot of ISAs that are only outbound that do really well. So you don't have to lean on inbounds. You know, what was your? I just wanted one more follow-up, and that's producing income. It's producing Okay. Yeah, but you're still making the outcome. It's producing it. Thank you, Lucia, for keeping me on point. Okay, so we're going to wrap up our next question. Um, I'm a single ISA looking to possibly hire um, more ISAs under me and become the head ISA. What is the change in pay once you have ISAs so that you're not like butting heads? Um, for us, so the donation increase um, really the department. Um, but the biggest thing is uh, having a bonus structure that's based off of the production of the team. Um, so I make sure that my team is expected to hit um, every quarter. So if I hit those quarters, then it gives the Okay, next question on the far side. Hi again. Um, one thing that we, I didn't get to ask you guys about the last Sorry. That's okay. We got this music coming back here. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask about is what your expectation is of the agent on the conversion side. Okay, so set to held. Uh, well, that's really the highest thing. So held to sign, meaning that they're signing the agreement. Correct. Either on the buyer side or the other side. For your teams, respectively, what's your expectation for your agents in order to continue to be fed these by the ISA? Or appointments, rather. Just, you have to have this signing ratio or no more appointments for you, basically. <laughs> Do you, if you have that? I think we're at about fifty percent um, design, but one thing that we've done that's really helpful is we still have the ISA following up even afterwards after they're going to happen, but they have designed. Uh, so our ISA is what we call every two weeks. And that does help to sort of the pressure. Okay, you said it usually takes about three months of con every two weeks, right? Do you okay. Anybody else? If you don't track that, that's fine. I, I would look for are they getting eighty percent to sign? I wouldn't like say you don't get any more appointments at that point, but if we're not, then we have a skill to work on. Yeah. That's that's and that might be my skill setting it, or the agent's still signing it, and that's gonna come from why didn't they sign it and figuring that out. Thank so eighty percent a good one. And that, that comes from MREA. Just Okay, real quick. Yes. I have two questions. where do you find like the niche person for an ISA? Um, so culture is a really big, big, big part of our company. Um, we have a lot of success um, by reaching out to people that are already on the team to see if they have friends that would want to join the team and immediately, you know, if it's somebody that you're close with, uh, it's probably a great culture fit. You can go and we've had a lot of success that way. You don't worry that if one of your buyer agents or your listing agents were to refer to say that somehow that person would be fed more leads? Oh, that's a track. That's a tracking thing. That's a that's a culture thing. Yeah, I just I've I've heard this. Yeah, I've seen it. Well, for us, I say this is the sign. Okay. So. Okay. This is a round robin. So I get it. Okay. Good question. And then the other thing is um, how we don't have that set up yet. We're looking to start ISAs, so that's a huge value in it. And um, so how do you make the, the people that are already on your team um, adapt to that in a trusty manner? Because just like when I went from the boat, both people and started the team. So um, one of the ways that we did, because we didn't originally for our buyer agents have, they were the ones handling the leads, and do, who here has been an agent? 
do you like being followed? Because what we found was our outside agents didn't like being followed. They didn't like having to stay and connect, connect and cultivate leads, and they also weren't doing a very good job of it. So we were losing a ton of money because they didn't have time because they really like to do other things and they're great at that. And so the way that Lance had that conversation was, you know, if if I could show you a way that you can make the same amount of money next year as you did this year and you don't have to leave cultivate, do you care where your splits are? It's split from the outfit agent <coughs> on our model. So like there's always a 50-50 split, 50 to the company, and then 50 being split other ways for, uh, for producers. But at the time, the buyer agents all said, yeah, if you can take that off me and I'll make the same amount of money next year, I'm all in. And they did because they had people cultivating those leads and making more money on those way. But then we can talk about it too. And, and by the way, this is 25. He just said he'll stay a little bit longer. So then thank you. We'll finish up with this here. No one else can that. All night. A good way to talk about commission splits though is a menu. So the, the item of setting an appointment is worth this much percentage. The item of doing this activity is this much percentage. And it makes it last when I say this, I do this, I do this, what? And it's more about the activity that was completed is worth what value. So if I'm an agent and I said my own, then I earn 10%. If the ISA did it, they said that they earn 10%. So talking about like a menu works really, really well when you're introducing Okay, over there, so if Frank goes to this day, you can walk off if you do. <laughs> All right, over there. Okay, quick question on your bonus structure versus growth and profit. They're done differently for your ISA. And then with your admin, if they bring a referral to the business, is that going to your ISA or how do you handle that? I think it's just, um, I think every team probably has that set up differently. Um, our admin can utilize the ISA if they want to, um, or they can set the appointment themselves um, and not, not pay the ISA. But just like with before, the ISA um, piece is split half with the team, half um, with the agent. So it, it's really a really small number um, at the end of the day. And I don't remember what was your first question, the first part of your question? Your bonus structure, so you're trying to push growth units. Versus profit. How do you do this? Well, we always, um, our philosophy on our team is if you push units, the profit will show up. Um, so we typically push units first, um, and then the money will show up with, with the push of production. And I'll just add to that specifically focus on listings, because listings will help the whole team. And then you typically earn more money on listings than you do buyers. You like both. Listing will help that business. How are you paying the ISAs on that, I guess? I what? How are you paying the ISAs like, on the bonus structure? Oh, the, the, typically, it's a 5 to 10% commission when it closes. Okay, that's another than, than that. I guess that's the, the salary and the percentage. Yeah, it's typically salary, commission upon close, and you want to make more money, and you just set more than close. And it, it works really well. It drives a lot of production. Yeah, great question. Okay, yes, last three people. A couple of questions. Um, I'm a solo agent, so I don't have a team that I can rely on to, you know, uh, find a new ISA. So I was wondering, besides your network, what other sites are there that maybe you can find ISAs um, that you use? And then the other is, um, you know, what experience or profession would make a good ISA? Military recruiters, college recruiters, anything that's a relationship-based sales process. So that's why military recruiters, college recruiters, they're used to talking to people about major life changes um, that have big impacts. I have just one, I have just one thing to add to that because I totally agree with you. Um, you can also leave posts on Indeed for free. And the other thing I will say is um, we've got a lot of folks who probably wouldn't have signed up to be an inside sales agent. It's not necessarily because that role defines them and they're really, like, couldn't wait to sit in the office all day for an hour on the phone. We have people who want to be in control of their finances. They want to be an agent that can produce the income based on the activities they put in. And they have lifestyles that make it easy for them to like to be in the office. So they may have things they're committed to at night. We can activities with their family. Plus, it's a right to travel. Just, there's something in their life that's really conducive to having more structure, 
However, they love the idea of real estate. Those two us have been a really great one. We've had a lot of luck hiring people to the community as well. Um, so like our tenders, we have two eyes on our team. Uh, it, it, great people skills, uh, easy to model, other people have done. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, there's that four and a half month gap before you start seeing those and then you start seeing them frequently. Um, and we're making people who work with a more shift with the ACO. Perfect, last two, and then we're wrapping All right, my question is absolutely with scheduling. Like, uh, how many hours do they, how high is they have to work? They more effective six hours, eight hours, uh, take a breaks. And I would really like to know what your schedule looks like. If your supervisor always says, hey, then you can go after the next call or not. So, um, so we have ISAs in the office from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, every weekday. And on Saturday, um, for my personal schedule, I usually do it in the office uh, around 8 to 9. And then on Sunday, I usually do it from 9 to 5. So you're as suspecting? <laughs> I'm in production also, yeah. So I, I'm in production. I'll be on the phones uh, typically between about 9 a.m. to um, about 12 noon. Um, and then after that, we're Our time on ISA? It's all about follow up and consistency. So when you're part time, you don't have to follow up and consistency. So they all work uh, eight hours a day? Yeah, and I'll be here because I'm a large team, so I'll share when I started as the only ISA is eight hours a day, like technically clocked in, if you want to say that. Six hours of it was on LinkedIn. And I look at it as if I'm not on LinkedIn six hours a day out of eight, and I'm hired to do LinkedIn training, then what's distracting me, and I need to get better with time blocking and communicating to my team that I can't do that. It's, it should be six out of eight hours on the phone as a, and that gives time to do other stuff. Right, so six out of eight on the phone. And then as a the team group, we started moving to longer coverage and shifts back in the day. The other two? What's that? The other two hours on the phone? Oh, like admin, team meetings, break, yeah, all that stuff. Great question. So basically, we six out of eight is the ratio. Great question. Last person. Yes, go ahead. Hey, guys, thank you for sharing. Um, you have a team of about uh, right now and we're kind of in the growing pain stage of the ISAs. Can we get a copy of your guys' systems and models? Yeah, so we have a site, it's called tlgshares.com. It's just free to go on and we share a lot of our systems and processes, our compensation plans on there, our various systems on there. We welcome anyone who could be who could find value from it to go on there and use our stuff.